Hello class, Mr. Linder here. In this video, I want to talk about graded potentials. Now, when we talk about the nervous system, usually the first kind of potential that comes up is action potentials. Um, and action potentials are the electrical signals that travel uh, along the axon of a neuron. But what's not oftentimes talked about is the signal that leads to the action potential, which is called the graded potential. When we talk about graded potentials, I want to focus on six aspects. So on the bottom of the screen, you can see number one, input signaling. Number two, travels along dendrites and cell bodies. Number three, uses a variety of channels. Number four, uses sodium, calcium, potassium, and chlorine. Number five, gets weaker with distance. And number six, summation. So these are all things that we can talk about in terms of graded potentials that have differences when we compare them to action potentials. So to start out with, how does the nervous system actually work? So a quick summary here, if we just look at uh, some basic multipolar neurons, um, we have dendrites, cell body, put a nucleus here, we have the axon, we have the axon terminals, uh, and we can actually connect that to another uh, multipolar neuron put another nucleus here and we'll extend this out with axon terminals. Um, and so when we talk about the nervous system, uh, we typically can talk about the electrical signaling. So let's put E for electrical, uh, followed by chemical signaling. And then we can go back to this idea of electrical signaling. And this is kind of the a uh, common way that the nervous system transmits information. We use electrical signaling, followed by chemical signaling, followed by electrical signaling again. Now that doesn't mean we can't have gap junctions and have communication uh, in an electrical sense from cell to cell, uh, but oftentimes we focus on this aspect of the nervous system. We know that action potentials travel along the axons. So we know the action potentials travel along the axons down to the axon terminals. And so we can put action potential down here on this neuron and it's traveling down towards the axon terminals. But how did the action potential get triggered? What happens at this location that we call the axon hillock? Well, at the axon hillock, we have to reach something called threshold. Threshold is the voltage that must be reached in order to trigger an action potential. But in order to reach threshold, you have to have excitatory signaling. There has to be some sort of input signaling that reaches threshold. And so we have electrical signals called graded potentials, but GP for graded potentials, that have to travel along the dendrites and cell bodies in order to trigger threshold in order for an action potential uh, to be generated. So I want to focus on this idea of a graded potential. So we know graded potentials are these input signals. Okay? Uh, and these input signals okay, travel along the dendrites and the cell body. Okay? But how do they actually uh, trigger threshold, or maybe they don't trigger threshold, uh, and how does that lead to an action potential, or it doesn't lead to an action potential. So let's take a look at a larger dendrite. So let's enlarge this here, and then we have our cell body, and then we have our axon, and we'll put the nucleus down over here, so we'll put in for nucleus there. So this is our axon and our axon hillock location. And then this is our dendrite over here. And this is our cell body, so we know where we are anatomically. So how does a graded potential actually lead to an action potential? Well, there can be a variety of channels that lead to graded potentials. I'm gonna put the letter R here for this box. Uh, R represents receptor and, and we have chemical signals, those chemical signals we typically refer to as neurotransmitters. Uh, and so neurotransmitters can be serotonin and dopamine and 
norepinephrine and acetylcholine and glycine and GABA and all kinds of different things. Um, and some neurotransmitters are going to be excitatory, letter E, excitatory, we'll go EX here, or they can be inhibitory, depending upon what kinds of channels we activate and what kinds of ions actually flow through them. So we use a variety of channels and there's actually different ions that flow through these channels in order to give us different types of graded potentials. And those graded potentials can either be excitatory or inhibitory. Oftentimes we refer to signals as EPSPs and IPSPs. The E standing for excitatory and the I standing for inhibitory. So EPSP is excitatory postsynaptic potential. IPSP is inhibitory postsynaptic potential. So neurotransmitters can bind to receptors, and a lot of times those receptors are some form of ion channel. So in this example here, we're talking about a chemical situation. Now this is a chemical channel where some ligand binds to the receptor, which is the ion channel, and it allows ions to either go in or out of the cell to give us an excitatory or inhibitory signal. Sometimes though, with graded potentials, we have mechanical signaling, uh, and sometimes we even deal with voltage-gated channels. But I wanna focus primarily on this idea of chemical-gated uh, systems. So the neurotransmitter binds to the receptor, and some ion's gonna travel either in or out of that uh, particular channel. And that's gonna lead to either an EPSP or an IPSP. So let's say, for example, the neurotransmitter binds to the receptor and sodium comes in. Well, sodium has a positive charge to it, and so that can lead to a depolarization. It's adding positive charges to the inside of the cell, so the resting membrane potential which for neurons is negative 70 millivolts, that resting membrane potential will become more positive. And so that's a depolarizing event. If that channel was allowing calcium to come in, the same situation would occur. Positive ions entering into the cell, depolarizing event, uh, and so we have an excitatory signal taking place. If it was a different receptor, and let's say some neurotransmitter binds to that receptor, and it lets chlorine come in. Well, chlorine has a negative charge. And so chlorine would cause the resting membrane potential to become more negative. Might go to negative 80 millivolts. That's what we call a hyperpolarizing event. And hyperpolarizing events are inhibitory graded potentials. So if we turn the system off, there's really not much more to talk about. You know, inhibitory signaling is gonna shut off the neuron, so of course there's not going to be uh, an action potential. Uh, but that doesn't allow us to continue the story. So although IPSPs are very important, it doesn't help us understand uh, the idea of getting weaker with distance. Uh, so I wanna talk more about that concept. Uh, but before I do that, there could be other channels. Uh, for example, there could be a channel that allows potassium to go out of the cell. And that too could lead to a hyperpolarization. So that's the interesting thing about graded potentials. They can be excitatory or they can be inhibitory depending upon the different ions that travel through the channels and, of course, the different neurotransmitters uh, that are interacting with those receptor slash ion channels. So let's get back to this idea, though, of a depolarization leading to something that's excitatory. So if the neurotransmitter binds to the receptor and it allows this sodium ion and, and multiple sodium ions to enter into the dendrite, we're getting a depolarizing event, and it's making the resting membrane potential become more positive. So let's say, for example, this part of the dendrite becomes minus 30 millivolts because of those positive ions that are entering into the cell. The rest of the cell still has a negative 70 millivolt resting membrane potential. So we've got this negative charge along the inside of the membrane. 
Well, sodium's a positively charged ion, opposites attract. So that sodium is going to begin to diffuse to areas of negative charge. But not all the sodium is going to reach that area. Some of the sodium is going to diffuse out of the cell. Some of the sodium is going to diffuse to other places within the cytosol. But some of the sodium is going to reach this next area of membrane. But because it's not all of the ions reaching this next area, the next area can't depolarize as much as the first area. And so maybe this area only reaches minus 40 millivolts. And so what happened to our graded potential? Well, our graded potential got weaker with distance. As the diffusion takes place from the initial area, to areas farther along the dendrite and cell body, you're gonna lose ions, whether they diffuse out of the cell or whether they diffuse to some other place in the cytosol. And so that's gonna cause the graded potential to become weaker with distance. So the sodium that reached this area and brought it to negative 40, some of that sodium is gonna reach the next area of membrane, opposites attract, but again, not all of it's gonna reach there because some of that sodium is gonna diffuse to other places. And so this area of membrane maybe is only minus 45 millivolts. It's getting weaker with distance. And then the sodium continues to diffuse and so forth and so forth. And so maybe at this area it's minus 50 millivolts. So what voltage do we have to have in order to trigger an action potential? Well the threshold value it's okay that it's getting weaker with distance as long as you reach threshold. The threshold value is negative 55 millivolts or more positive. So, or more positive. And that's key. It doesn't have to be negative 55. It just has to be negative 55 or more positive. So, if it's negative 54, negative 53, negative 52, negative 50, negative 45, negative 30. Those are all more positive values. But what if it's negative 56 millivolts? Then we wouldn't reach threshold and we wouldn't trigger an action potential. So as long as we are at something negative 55 or more positive, we reach threshold. And that means we can trigger an action potential. And the reason we can trigger an action potential is because in the axon membrane, you have sodium voltage-gated channels. Voltage-gated channels are activated by certain voltages. They are voltage-gated. And so the voltage gate here is negative 55 or more positive. And so when that sodium voltage-gated channel opens, it allows more sodium to enter into the axon. And that sodium is going to begin your action potential signal. So graded potentials lead to action potentials. Now to ensure that we actually trigger an action potential, the last concept for graded potentials is this idea of summation. Summation means to add things together. So what if you had a situation where you have a dendrite and that dendrite has several receptors on it, which they do, and they're all responding to the same neurotransmitter, and they're all opening up to allow sodium to enter into the dendrite. So we have sodium coming in from multiple locations. Well, what that does is that creates a larger depolarization. You have an increased depolarization event. You're adding together all these different excitatory signals so that you get a much larger depolarization at the start. So maybe the resting membrane potential becomes zero millivolts. You went from negative 70 all the way to zero millivolts. As the signal gets weaker with distance, as it diffuses through the, the cytosol of the dendrite in the cell body, there's a very good chance you're still going to be at threshold when you get to the axon hillock. 
So that's graded potentials, and that's a little bit on summation. I hope that helps you guys.